Okay, good morning, everyone. We're approaching a nice round number, so I think this is a good point to get started. Um, before we begin the first panel session, and just to kick off the day, we wanted to take a moment to welcome you all on behalf of us here at Trinity College Dublin, and to introduce ourselves, the organizers of this event. So the idea for this conference came from the wonderful mind of our colleague, Ralph Moore. And the goal was seeing as we are working in an institute that is dedicated to interdisciplinarity and public engagement with the arts and humanities to host a conference that demonstrates the relevance and significance of engaging with the ancient world, both in academic and non-academic contexts. We were quite keen in that we didn't want to restrict the content of this conference to topics that are solely associated with classics or classical studies. And you will have noticed from the program that this has resulted in speakers with quite a wide range of backgrounds and interests commenting on various aspects of the ancient world and ancient cultures um, with a particular emphasis on pedagogy and outreach. As you know, these presentations were pre-recorded with the exception of the keynote and we look very much look forward to hearing that later. So the presentations were pre-recorded and uploaded to YouTube and we hope that like us, you have enjoyed watching them over the past 10 days or so. So the panels today then um, are structured in such a way as to bring speakers from different fields together to foster more diverse conversation. And they give us the opportunity to reflect on the presentations we've been watching to ask our speakers questions about them and really just to hear more about their wonderful work. So on behalf of myself, Ralph, Eleanor, Kat and George, we thank you for joining us here today um, for these discussion panels and in our endeavor to answer the question, what have the ancients ever done for us? So with that, I happily hand over to Rebecca who will kickstart the first session and introduce us to our panelists. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so my name's Rebecca Usherwood. I'm an assistant professor in late antique studies in the classics department at Trinity College Dublin, and I'm thrilled to be kicking off this conference. And I think you'll agree with me that the topic is hugely important and relevant. And um, what the organizing team have done, putting this together on the online um, format is a huge achievement of vision and teamwork. Uh, so enormous congratulations to them for putting this together with such enthusiasm and professionalism. So I'm gonna begin by um, introducing everybody in the first panel uh, and reminding you of the name of their paper. So first, um, Dr. Conan Doyle who did his UG, uh, undergrad and uh, master's at UCD, then a PhD in Anglo-Saxon Norse at Cambridge University. And he's currently an independent scholar working on his first monograph, which sounds very closely related to the topic of his presentation, which is classical and late antique medicine in, the early, in early medieval Europe, the curious vernacular afterlife of Galen before Galenism. Then Evangelia, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Evangelia Christi, uh, Christa Doolidou, who is a PhD candidate in history and archeology span at the University of Athens, um, also working in the banking sector uh, and holds a master's from the University of Cyprus and a bachelor's from the University of Athens. And her paper was entitled, The Archeological Stories Under the School of Hum of, Under School Histories, The Making of Classroom Archeology span in the Public Schools of Cyprus. Then Dr. Irina Manea, who um, holds an MA in Ancient History and a PhD in Nordic Studies, um, which was on the reception of Norse myth and pagan metal music, again, very related to her topic of her presentation, which was on the necessity of studying Viking Age. Then um, we have Miguel um, Abrantes, who is a PhD candidate in classical studies at the University of Coimbra and researches on, uh, on mythology and classical tradition. Uh, and his was titled, what, has class what Have Classics Ever Done For Us? Some Answers From Around the World. Rory O'Sullivan, who is a first year PhD in the classics department here at Trinity, where he is researching philosophical influences on Thucydides. And he did his undergraduates and masters at Trinity. I actually taught him last year. <laughs> and his presentation is on Aphrodite Lost, the presence of absence and the study of the ancient world. Um, then Wen Jing Fang, who is a first year PhD in the School of Chinese at University of Hong Kong, working on early China, particularly musical antiquities and texts in the pre-King period, 
whose paper is was uh, re uh, receiving messages from heaven, the sage in early China. Eleanor Neal, uh, who is second year PhD in classics at Trinity, uh, did her MPhil in public history and cultural heritage, and a BA in ancient history and archaeology. And as I think really showed in her paper, has worked in commercial archaeology and the cultural heritage sector. And her paper was titled Community Archaeology in the Digital Age. And then finally, Dr. Melinda Letts, who uh, studied, at, uh, archeo uh, studied at Oxford, worked as a research assistant to Keith Hopkins, left academia for some very impressive roles in um, overseas development and the UK health charities, has been awarded an OBE. Uh, returned to academia in 2009, uh, our doctoral research on ancient medicine, and now lectures at Jesus College and Manchester College, Oxford, where she specializes in Greek and Latin teaching, particularly the active Latin that she discusses in her presentation. So I welcome all and thank you for some fantastic presentations. Um, just to say that we have some questions which have already come in, but um, and I will be asking some of those, but I remind the audience that they can ask questions or make comments using the chat function or raising their hand through the reactions tabs. And uh, they will be uh, uh, invited to unmute so they can ask any questions. So please feel free to do that. Um, firstly, we're just sort of a larger question for all of our presenters from this panel. There was a huge variety of different topics here, but one thing sort of stood out to me is that you were all very concerned with create, having this conversation about the relevance of antiquity and the medieval world to the modern world um, and to have the wider public recognize the real world relevance of that you all consider antiquity to have. Uh, and <laughs> without trying to start on a sort of more negative note, but have there been any sort of roadblocks or frustrations that you have experienced in this process, either sort of personally or institutionally? And do you have any advice for us for how we might overcome these kind of frustrations or roadblocks? I can kick that off if you want. Um, I think um, it's hard sometimes um, for people who um, are live in an academic world where we're all very sort of involved with our academic lives to reach beyond that. Um, and for a long time, we weren't academia as a as a wide, you know, sector wasn't really required to do that. We were able to just live in our bubble and talk about our academic things and speak to each other using sort of exclusionary language and things that don't, um, that didn't invite people in, but really were more concerned with excluding people. Um, I think now we've not across the board, obviously, but um, there is a turn towards making um, academic pursuits more accessible. Um, and so, sorry, construction outside. Um, the, I, I think in terms of a hurdle, it, something that we have all faced is moving away from tradition and traditional academic tropes kind of, of, of saying, well, this is the way that it's always done. That's fair enough, but we're not going to be doing it that way anymore. Um, so that, that's kind of my, <laughs> my take on that. Um, if, can I add something to that, Rebecca? Yeah, I, go ahead. I, yeah, I think I would. I, I mean, it's it's a great question, but, and and it actually goes to the heart of, of the of the way my career has gone. Because when I when I originally left and decided not to conduct doctoral research, well, there were two or three reasons. One of which was beyond my control, but there was also a strong sense of should I be inside the ivory tower or should I be outside there in the world? Um, and I think at that time I didn't see a way of bridging that gap and I was very driven to go out into the world and try to make a change and try to change the world for the better. Um, but um, my own personal love for the subject just kind of in the end won out. Um, and what I find now and what I've talked about in my paper, what, what is so exciting about what we're doing now um, is that people do say, people say two things, they say, well, classics how is that relevant but you know so many people when I meet them and I say what I do more often than not people go oh my god I wish I'd learned Latin 
oh my god I wish I'd worked harder at Latin at school oh god I really wish I you know so on so I think there is a, a real um, interest uh, in in our subject and by trying to make the languages accessible to people um, I think that that's an exciting way of 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 responding to that now if we were to get active Latin into every school in the country which is an, maybe an impossible dream I don't know of course we would not be creating enormous hordes of future classicists but we would be lighting in those children and those who would then grow up to be citizens that just you know the idea um maybe that we're not alone in time and space that people in other times and countries and cultures have said interesting things to us and that cross-cultural understanding of course is absolutely crucial to our world today so i think that i think there are enormous amounts of relevances actually and i would just finish by saying that i think that that the, the need to understand different cultures which is so important today um takes many forms and teaching children at school that ancient cultures are different cultures and they can understand them is part of that. Poland, you, you had a point to make, you're, you're muted, but yeah. Yeah, I, I just figured out how to unmute myself again. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> when I started my academic journey, I was very much content to uh, see myself in an ivory tower, but uh, especially recent years, I've begun to notice that what we study is relevant to the present day and to uh, questions and problems in the present day. And I think this very much chimes with what uh, Irina Maria was uh, saying about the necessity of studying the Viking Age, uh, because sometimes the past can be used for, or ideas about the past can be used for nefarious purposes uh, so the imagery of the past can be used very darkly and very wrongly and so uh, I was very pleased to see what Irina was saying there uh, because I have noticed very similar things in in the areas that I study and I think it's our job as people who study the ancient and uh, late antique and uh, medieval worlds to actually correct misconceptions, to point out where people are misappropriating uh, for nefarious purposes, ideas of the past. Um, and so much, the, the more I study, the more I realize that it, it's relevant to the present day. It, it answers questions uh, that we have now. I mean, I, I'll let someone else speak now, I think. Irina, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your remark. Uh, I just wanted to add the very simple fact, um, which might be obvious for us, but not for uh, the general public, is that we, if we don't uh, bridge these gaps and if we don't express ourselves regarding topics that we have researched and we are continuing to research, there are other ones who are going to do it. And usually on many YouTube channels, as far as I have seen, especially regarding uh, all things Norse, uh, Anglo-Saxon or uh, whatever is popular now, nowadays, especially with those, uh, with these TV series and so on. Uh, there are many self-appointed gurus, I might say, that um, they tend to believe they know a lot of stuff and try to convince others that they do. And they fa and in fact, they are just augmenting some prejudices and some very, very, um, uh, very severe misconceptions that really need to be corrected. Um, otherwise, we're going to keep on seeing um, manifestations on the streets, uh, such as those that we have seen um, in, in the past years. Um, at political uh, rallies or uh, whatever. So I think it's very important to get out of this of this ivory tower because humanity is, um, if it has a low demand, so to speak, in comparison with other topics nowadays or subjects which are popular in universities, it, it is also a little bit our fault, I would say, or the fault of the people working in the area, so to speak. Yeah. Was my head. Miguel. Um, I was thinking about what you were what you were all saying essentially, um, and uh, I think that the big problem is that some people. I'm obviously I'm not going to give pro uh, specific examples, um, but sometimes there is some kind of research in classics that uh, leads us to an maybe an incorrect area where we focus too much in subjects that just don't matter to the overall public. And that tends to be a problem because if we are conducting a huge research 
on a, on a topic that matters to very small people, um, sometimes people may think that classics is all about that, about, um, let's say, researching in what foot Achilles was it with an arrow. And that tends to give um, an incorrect idea of what we too often we do, because people start thinking, why? Why are they even researching this kind of topic? That tends to be a big problem in classics. Uh, the research, maybe um, the lack of research in some topics that are super interesting, and at the same time, an extensive research in other areas that too often um, outside people do not care about and cannot see any kind of interest in. That tends to be an issue, in my opinion. I, I would say sort of in defense that what all of us work on is super interesting to us. And I think it's uh, what is super interesting is super subjective. And I think maybe it's the onus is on us to effectively communicate what is interesting and important about what we all do. As someone who works on a niche thing, which other people would probably find uninteresting. Rory? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to chime in because I think that the, the Irish kind of context is sort of interesting here. Like I'm from Cork and have no necessarily connection to this. And I think like it, it compared to, let's say, you know, the UK or France or America, where classics is sort of a big institution in Ireland, it really has no presence. It's really quite marginal. And I would definitely have the experience a lot of, you know, talking to family or friends, thinking, geez, what, why would you do that? Do you know what I mean? Uh, and I think that the you know, how I respond to that is to the, or the, the answer that we need to produce in a way has to be a positive answer. It has to be a real, here's like something that this can bring. Uh, and for me, that is simply about, you know, we could live very differently. You know, our, our, the way that we are in very simple ways are the product of just the way that we choose to be around each other and uh, to show the diversity of what humanity can be and what it could be and what it could do is what I see in this, yeah. I also think that there might be an argument there that we should take into account what people who are not academics are interested in and help that uh, inform our choices in terms of what we study. Um, not so much that like we um, need to not study things that we can't find large audiences for, but that the people who are not necessarily always involved in academic sort of pursuits can be involved in this sort of choice making aspect of it. I think that's interesting and I, I'd try and just relate that to what Miguel said actually I was I was smiling when he said what he said because actually um, that is a question that that, that somebody who is uh, you know a, 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 a friend of mine who is not a classicist has asked me um how do we know that Achilles was injured in the foot and what, so so and, and and so where did that whole story come from I mean sorry that is not my substantive point here it just made me made me smile when you use that as an example because it is a great example and yet um uh, has that strange relevance but I just wanted to pick up on what Conan said which I think that the misappropriation argument is really important and to see people saying that classics should be if you like you know slimmed down because it because it it it, it it's it's misappropriated no i think it's it's a reason for um helping more people to access it and helping more people to understand that you know out of that great cohort of kids who may want to learn latin will come the future classicists of our generation uh, of next generation and if they can be as diverse from as diverse a group as possible then they will be able to combat that misappropriation and even if they don't become classicists they might we might just be able to help people say well, if somebody says this, you know, it's just one person's interpretation. It would be interesting to find out at least what other people say, um, Homer or Plato or whoever said. So we can encourage combating misappropriation, I think. And I think that's really important. Thank you, um, Evangela. Firstly, just to apologize profusely for mangling your name so, it's so okay. badly in the introduction, but please. It's, it's, uh, it's Evangelia. It's, uh, Evangelia. It's a, it's a difficult okay. name. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm expanding this great conversation this morning. Uh, and what to Ms. Letts is uh, referring to, I just wanted to say that I was really worried because archaeology is not included at all at our schools in Cyprus. So um, I thought that this was a great opportunity to see what children are taught uh, through their history classes in Cyprus 
and uh, how difficult it is to include all this archaeological information because uh, analyzing our curricula and history textbooks, many information is left out. So yes, uh, actually I have um, a one re remark from Ms. Letts and one question for Ms. Neil, if that's okay. Uh, so just uh, just to say to Ms. Letts, uh, congratulations for the for the great um, uh, paper and talk, and that uh, in public schools of Cyprus we are actually taught ancient Greek and Latin. In uh, um, I thought you were mentioning that um, uh, ancient Greek and Latin uh, are taught in private schools uh, in Cy in in UK. And this is the opposite in Cyprus. <laughs> so uh, we are examining ancient Greek and uh, Latin uh, to enter cl um, classical uh, studies and our, uh, archaeological studies in Greece and Cyprus. So this is maybe help you to your... <laughs> That's really great to hear. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Uh, and for Ms. Neil, congratulations also for the paper. And I would like to ask you, uh, why do you think locals in Cyprus are not interested to community archaeology? I think that that's maybe a strong way of putting it. Um, I think that it is not necessarily that people aren't interested, mm -hmm. um, but more that the opportunity hasn't been um, fleshed out in the same way that it has in other places. So, like, um, in Ireland and in the UK, we have mm -hmm. these like sort of long histories of um, local historical societies that have their own sort of um, uh, socioeconomic groups that they are reaching, but it's still in the sort of um, uh, in the mind of people that these things exist. Um, and so, you know, in different places, different things grasp at people's imagination and what they're interested in and Cyprus doesn't have exactly the same sort of um, relationship in that way um, w that doesn't mean that people aren't interested mm -hmm. I think it means that the, the opportunities haven't been we have we don't have yet the mechanisms to exactly. to react to exactly and part of that is as well um, how um, centralized uh, it's a small country so things are not going to be as decentralized as it might be in other places, but there is the very step-by-step um, uh, -step process for archeology span that's, that's undertaken, which doesn't um, necessarily always have room for other ways of um, expanding who's participating, um, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible. Uh, it just is, you know, it, it's, it's this idea of something new. We're doing something different um, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, I, it's it's right. It's happening now, which is exciting for me in my research. Yes. Like, good luck. It's thank, very you. Interesting. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, it's right on the edge of sort of, um, yeah, I, like in different places. So in the U.S., there's like a long history um, that kind of is involved with, um, kind of came from the indigenous archaeology mm -hmm. movement. So that has influenced things in a way that they haven't influenced archaeology and so just different different ways of looking at things thank, thank you. you i think we're getting a very authentic trinity experience because i think that was the sound of an authentic trinity seagull in the background of anna yeah brilliant you would there yeah. are they're the sound of trinity campus yeah. so. Red, red <laughs> Um, Wenjin, we haven't heard from you yet, so I wanted to call upon you with a with a question of so your paper traced the the evolution of this connotation of Zheng as this this concept in a world a word and a character in very 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 early stages over like one thousand five hundred years you traced it, but was it original usage and reference to ancestor worship and communication and interpretation of messages from the divine was that replaced by other vocabulary or was that retained in later meanings as much as you can trace yes in my presentation uh i uh, i analyzed the 
epimology of the word sage. And it, these, uh, these characters, or I should say scripts, are, are, are from the oracle bones and, uh, and, and the uh, bronze vessel inscriptions. They are the real words in, in, in the antiquities from thousand years ago, as I said. And uh, it's since Chinese is a kind of characters that was um, written like a picture, yes, uh, it's, it's it's kind of different from a language like Latin or uh, other words. Um, they, they, these characters, when we say when we say the different components, we just think, uh, is it a kind of abstract picture or can it? Uh, can it show some meaning of, like I said, a shen was uh, a shen is consists of uh, a symbol of a year and uh, and a person and a mouth. So um, the interpretation of shen in like in le in lit shang in the oracle bones, uh, it's uh, interpretation from uh, from from from. Uh, more, more than a world. Uh, I also use some. I also use some information in later period, like Han Dynasty. Um, uh, but I take it as a secondary source um, to interpret those characters uh, because uh, they are also they are also interpretations to the ancient worlds. Um, Yes. Actually, it struck me that the similarities between what you were saying about tracing the potential origins of these characters to what Melinda was saying about how Latin can empower people to sort of expand their vocabulary and their understanding behind the sort of foundational parts of language and where that might come from. It's fascinating. Lisa has her, has her hand up for a question. Thank you, <clears throat> Rebecca. Um, I just had a question for Wen Jing as well, just off the back of that. I found your presentation so interesting and engaging, and it was just, it was a pleasure to have it as part of this conference. And again, I, I have done some work looking at Greek values and virtues, and it's interesting to see similarities in how one word can have a surface meaning, but deeper connotations. But my question to you is, you mentioned, um, men and women embodying Sheng, um, I think in relation to aristocrats talking about their forebears. But my question is, do men and women embody it in different ways? Are there expectations that men embody this wisdom differently to women? Or, or is it just based on social status? Do we have any evidence for that? Thank you. Oh, thank you for your question, Lisa. Um, yeah. In my presentation, I haven't uh, take men and women into my consideration of this. Even in ancient world, uh, in, 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 in ancient characters, maybe people haven't divide very specific meaning uh, to, the, uh, to, 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 gen to gender, yes. Uh, in the character shown, um, we cannot very surely to say it, it, it the symbol of uh, the symbol of human is a man or women. Maybe I can take it uh, uh, into consideration in my in my following research. Not at all, thank you. I mean, your presentation it, it it was had so much detail. You were discussing it over such a vast range of time, so it's it you just covered so much, and I find it really engaging. Thank you. Thank you. It was also intimidatingly slick. It was such a beautifully put together presentation as well. Melinda, you have a, a, a point. Uh, yes, actually, no, it's, it is also um, a question for Wen Jing, actually, and because and I've been keeping an eye on the chat as messages have been coming in. And, and this is the kind of thing, I mean, you know, in a way, it doesn't surprise me, it's depressing to see it, you know, Romania, South Africa, New Zealand, United States. We already know in Australia, you know, that there's very little teaching, if any, of Latin and Greek. And yet, um, and, and Wenjing, it's slightly unfair of me to ask you to kind of, you know, um, give a view on, on behalf of a whole kind of area of the world, but, but I can't help noticing that a, a lot of the, 
applications um, we get for classics and a lot of the applications we get of people wanting to learn Latin in the Latinitas um, project are from China, from Singapore, from Japan and from Korea. You know, that's where we, we're getting a lot. So it, it's I just wondered if this was a phenomenon that you in particular, you know, you, you were aware of whether anybody else has a view on this, because it. it we can't draw major conclusions from these um, uh, impressionistic um, uh, bits of information we're get, getting in, but it is certainly, anecdotally anyway at least, it seems to me that there's, that there's um, a lot of interest in a part of the world where Latin and Greek have not traditionally been um, studied before. Am I right or wrong? And does anyone else have a view? I mean, it's a bit unfair to ask Wenjing to answer that whole question, but it just strikes me. Uh, uh, thank you, Melinda. Um, actually, um, it's uh, yes, it has some similarities in Chinese and like Japanese, um, and um, and. The, the components of the characters in my presentation in the slides, um, it's kind of similar to the Latin, la, the the roots of Latin. Uh, when you when you teach uh, when you teach pupils about uh, the root of Latin, and I, I, I remember that they said it helps them to uh, it helps them to enhance the uh, comprehension of English. Uh, other other language in the same uh, language uh, in, in the same fam language families. Uh, when when we study the components of ancient Chinese characters, we can also learn uh, the origin of modern Chinese characters. Um, and I guess that's kind of that's some meaning of why we study these uh, ancient Chinese. Yes, I think I, I mean I can I can see that I and, and I'm interested as well in the, the what seems to be a re, you know a surge of interest in studying Latin and Greek um, among Chinese students and Singaporean students and from the from the applications that that we're getting anyway that there seems to be that that interest and that's something I'm curious about but maybe others haven't noticed the same phenomenon. <laughs> Um, I was just wanted to sort of come back to something Irina said at the end of her paper. Um, so she, you finished with some, ended with some recommendations for how historians might proceed um, to try and sort of, because otherwise we're left in the position that we watch um, the adaptation of, of the periods that we specialize in in popular culture and then we're left as sort of commentators to a smaller audience to des describe and sort of pull apart what what is the sort of the products and the the roots of this distortion and you said that we have to be more outward looking that we have to think about popularizing our findings and and bridging this gap between academia and public uh, popular culture and i was wondering if you have any recommendations for particular forms that should take firstly but secondly and again me being all negative again but what if the industry isn't interested? Um, yeah, what if, you know, ultimately their creative form takes precedence and actually the fiction is more compelling than... So you mean uh, recommendations uh, like sites where you can write or... Um, well, I do have a recommendation actually. It is a um, um, popular history project that I have been um, uh, collaborating with for I think two months now. Uh, it's called the World History Encyclopedia. It's the former ancient history encyclopedia. It's a very, very good site. And it's not, um, it's not for beginners either. It's more like, let's say, intermediate level. Uh, but I think it's really, really good. I mean, you have, uh, you also have bibliography um, and a lot of academic references, but in the same time, the style is a little simpler. Um, I mean, also upper secondary uh, students can can use this um, encyclopedia for further reference. So I think this is a good example of how uh, we can uh, balance, um, you know, between that very maybe obscure and complicated um, academic language and um, uh, just reaching a wider audience. So I, I think there are possibilities to do that or um, even YouTube channels. 
YouTube channels with various clips explaining some things which people might be wondering about, but so far uh, they only have heard maybe contradictory or insufficient information on. I have uh, just... Sorry, yeah, go ahead, please. Um, just something just that kind of ties these two strands together, which is I, for the um, participants on this panel who actively teach, um, I, you know, I teach undergraduates occasionally, but it's not really the same thing. Um, what do you see in terms of um, like a political agenda being pushed through sort of early level um, education and like where does the ancient, the study of the ancients fall into that political agenda if there, if there is one? Um, I was especially thinking that maybe Melinda or Evangelia had some thoughts about that. In Cyprus, the political agenda is that um, we, uh, the, the history school books are sent straight away from Greece. So this is something that is really interesting because uh, we, we, we use our uh, history school books written from Cypriot professors, um, but these uh, books are written uh, 20, 25 years ago. So there, there is a major uh, issue arising from this because where uh, children are not even taught about the Turkey invasion and et cetera. So it's a great problem for, for, uh, for teaching uh, history in Cyprus. Uh, yeah, and Eleanor, sorry, I, I actually lost you, lost audio briefly during your question, but I think you were asking whether um, whether you thought w w w to what extent decisions about the teaching of Latin and Greek might be connected to um, political agendas to be, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we have a, a national curriculum um, in Britain and uh, it, and it is, it is subject to um, to, to trends um, and to uh, every politician who, who uh, every prime minister who comes in says he's going to they're going to sort out the education system and make it relevant there's a huge amount of things battling for space in the national curriculum um, and um, and I think because of the way because of the ease of there's been a sense that nobody needs to learn foreign languages because everybody in the world speaks English um, and, and, and and I think that has allowed other things to uh, um, squeeze out languages they know people no longer have to study a language to GCSE anymore and haven't had to for some time um, and uh, so um, I think there are political but they're mainly it to do with electoral politics it's politicians wanting to make themselves you know popular in order to get um, voted back in again and I think if, if uh, I want to make this argument um, to government it is it, it, it needs to be at a kind of more micro level which is you know looking at exactly how um, can we help children overcome economic and social disadvantage? How can we actually help them negotiate other subjects by having a clearer understanding of how languages work? And I think that is not something that, that a debate that will be played out on the front pages of the national newspapers or in big party conferences. I think it's almost trans, trans party, um, really. Uh, and, and that's the level at which I think um, we, we need to work. And I don't think we want to get ourselves involved in arguments about whether, you know, about whether the history curriculum is, is the right sort of curriculum. I would go back to saying, give people the power so far as possible to read sources for themselves or to understand that sources are always interpreted to us. And then you've given people skills for life. Um, Miguel, is your hands up in relation to the same point? Oh, uh, sorry, but Professor Brian has some questions. Yeah, no, I was, that's what I was thinking. I was saying, if it was coming on from this, if not, I, I was going to go to, to Brian. Brian's had his hand up, his virtual hand up for a while, thankfully, so he's not got a dead hand. Um, could you please sure. ask your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Well, it's, it, it's not really a question, but it is uh, about this. Uh, I mean, that was uh, fantastic. So many things uh, uh, raised issues of um, importance. Um, if uh, if you need to silence me, just uh, just mute me, Lisa. Uh, when you get bored, because uh, I could talk for ages. But one of the uh, uh, one of the big uh, things that's coming out of the conversation 
really, it seems to me, is usefulness. Um, I, I was struck in uh, Melinda's talk about uh, emphasizing the, uh, the usefulness of Latin, not in the way that I learnt it, and uh, I went to a, a public school, uh, guilty as charged, uh, where uh, grammar, knowing every single bit of grammar was somehow made you a superior person. This just actually improves your control uh, of language. I mean, that, that usefulness is something that I do think we need to, uh, to emphasize uh, so that, in fact, we have a responsibility for uh, teaching what I saw referred to somewhere ages ago as the, the language of success. Um, and I think that is important. There was a debate in, in, uh, in Britain, uh, certainly about the, uh, um, the, the Queen's English as against uh, more creative English that didn't bother about punctuation and capital letters and so on. Uh, and I remember talking to uh, an advertising, uh, head of an advertising agency in Dublin uh, about this. And she said, uh, when they get uh, a letter of application written badly. Uh, it's not a, a sign, oh, this could be a, a creative person, somebody who doesn't obey the rules. They, they put it straight in the waste paper basket. So the language of success, it seems to me, is something to emphasize. I don't mean that Latin was successful because they ran an empire, it's a, a dangerous route, but just it, it teaches, improves manifestly. Uh, it not necessarily on you learn Spanish easier. If you want to learn Spanish, you learn Spanish. You don't learn Latin first, it seems to me. Um, but usefulness carried over from uh, into um, uh, what uh, Miguel said and and how we talk about what we do, it seems to me. I uh, did uh, some uh, fundraising at higher levels for, for Trinity. And one of the things we did was, was, was training. Uh, in, in how to, to tell a story. Uh, academics think they should be automatically terribly good at this. Uh, and uh, after the first session, I gave what I thought was a crackerjack story uh, about my work. And the person in charge was talking over coffee afterwards. And he said, uh, that was terrible. Um, in fact, there was an adjective in front of terrible, which I, I won't repeat. Uh, we're not good at telling the stories. And even, it seems to me, I disagree with Miguel, uh, even if your PhD is on the, the imperfect tense in, uh, in Terence, you should be able to tell that story. Uh, and actually, you, we do need to be trained in it. It's, it's not quite as simple as people uh, think. We tend to ignore the emotional element. You're not going to persuade a big donor to give money, for instance, uh, uh, with, with arguments, it, it, it's emotion. So um, the, the usefulness, uh, I was reading a note from Annika, I think about classics at Howard, and obviously there's, uh, there's a, a threat to this. And we, we haven't told our story well, I, I would say, because with Latin disappearing in these places uh, and so on, um, we, we can't have told our story well. I, I have I, I said this before in a different context, but um, there are very interesting reports written by uh, Google on their own uh, employment uh, record. That was something they started in 2008 called Project Oxygen, and then they followed it up with uh, Project Aristotle, looking at what makes good work uh, Google workers or or Google Teams, it was not STEM subjects. And I, I quote from the, uh, the Google's Vice President of Consumer Products, it's 10 years ago now, we will be hiring about 6,000 people this year and probably four to 5,000 from the humanities or liberal arts. Uh, we are not getting this message across. I suspect actually it's done better in Britain than we uh, do in Ireland. Uh, but uh, LinkedIn, Google, Microsoft, the top, uh, the top employers or the huge employers in the world, they actually employ lots of lots of arts people, uh, and somehow or other we do not get that across. And just to uh, finish, it was one of the responses that Miguel got to his his question uh, uh, answers from around the world, and one of them said, uh, "I'm now an enlightened intellectual, but but I'm unemployed." The connection there, it's absolutely crucial that we break that notion. You do classics or you do history or any humanities, and uh, you might be a school teacher. You won't in Ireland, it's extremely difficult to get jobs as a school teacher, uh, or in the, the soft, uh, uh, soft industries and so on. Um, 
this is just not correct. We are not getting, there's a, a, a big gap between actually what employers do and what the, often at least, the, uh, the public perception is. Uh, and I feel I've, I failed in, in, in my time, certainly in uh, leadership roles, but we've got to do better, I think. I, I wouldn't say that you failed, Brian. That's well, about it. No, it's just oh. <laughs> we, we got that message. We haven't really got the message across. I would say, or, or maybe other people feel uh, feel differently, but just looking at the uh, the decline of, of something like Latin, I mean, that is, it, that's just extraordinary, really. Yeah, and I mean, I, actually, Britain's done a, a super job uh, with uh, Classics for All, Chris uh, Pelling, and uh, people like Belinda. Um, but we need to to learn the lessons. How do how do we actually get the message across. It's not elitist, it's not, it is just a really valuable sort of educational tool, uh, especially at a, uh, at quite a, a, quite a young age. It, uh, it just trains people in how to deal with the, the system of language, whichever. Uh, I thought I'd just to butt in, but I, I just wanted to add there that I think that's incredibly important. I feel really passionately about that. And I feel when I read that there was a report this week, probably distorted. It was only a media report. I haven't gone to find out, you know, exactly what the story is, but that at Hull University students were going to be uh, no longer required to write um, good English and they were not going to be marked down on and so on and so on, because this was to do with widening access. But what I felt was that it's not going to help them in the long run. It's not going to help them when they get out into the into into the real world, um, and, and I feel that is the message that has to get across. So a lot of inequalities reside in the fact that some people know how to get a job by writing well or whatever it is. So we need to keep on fighting that. And I agree with you, Brian. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't they find that in the um, the inner city projects in America in Chicago was it uh, Philadelphia? That rather surprising when they introduced Latin. Uh, that uh, one of the startling results was uh, a dramatic improvement in the uh, in the use of, uh, of language of, uh, of English. Uh, and that, as Melinda was saying, is the beginnings of uh, evening out some, uh, some of the inequalities of opportunity. Um, yes, it's, 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 keep studying Latin, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Yes, indeed. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up that I know we have a couple of hands still up and I'm sorry haven't but this is just the first panel and I think a lot of the issues that we are discussing now will be relevant and come up again so I'm sure you will have um, the opportunity to ask uh, the same question or make the same comment that you're going to shortly but just to um, thank everyone for their questions for the discussion. Thank particularly our, our panelists here for such interesting, um, yes, as Ralph says, if you still have questions, please feel free to leave them there in the chat because we're all reading that. But thank you very much. I'm gonna pass back to you, uh, Lisa, now. Absolutely. <clears throat> oh, my voice is gone. Thank you so much, everyone. That was an excellent start to the day. We're now gonna take a 15 minute break, get caffeinated. We'll see you back here in 15 minutes for the second panel. And thank you all so much for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you.